Okay, part two of our lymphatic audio series. When we left part one, we were talking about this diagram here. One side of this diagram is a perfect living environment of the cells in your body. The other side of this diagram, we will find a cellular environment where we have loss of energy, we have sickness, and chronic disease is just a stone's throw away. Which side is which? Now, when I saw this diagram for the first time, I thought, well, I know the human body has quite a bit of water in it. We need water to survive. A huge percentage of us is water. And these cells look juicy, surrounded by liquid here on the right-hand side. But the cells on the left-hand side look dried out and parched. There's barely enough water to separate these poor cells here. In fact, I thought the left-hand side looked just like a picture of Death Valley. Well, it turns out I was dead wrong. The side on the left-hand side is the indeed uh, is indeed the perfect living environment for the cells in your body. And I came to find out that this state was known as the dry state, believe it or not, a term coined back in the early 1960s by a man named Dr. Arthur C. Guyton, who taught at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. He also wrote a book that ended up being studied by thousands and thousands of doctors because that book was called The Textbook of Medical Physiology, used in medical colleges all over the United States. A very, very well-known book. So, why is the state of the cells on the left-hand side the one we want to be in? And how do we end up in the state that we see on the right-hand side? And how can we get out of it? What does this diagram mean? Well, to answer that question, we're going to take a crash course in the circulatory system, or parts of the circulatory system. And since I have basically just a few minutes to cram in 80 years of research, we're going to start right at the ground level. And that is where blood capillaries feed our bodies at the cell level. At the cell level you will find that the blood capillaries have very tiny pores in them. Just little guys. And why do we have holes in our blood capillaries when our body worked so hard with a combination of the heart beating and nerve force to get the blood down to this tiny level and now we find out we have holes in our blood capillaries is the blood just gonna squirt out all over the place and kill us well <clears throat> no there's wisdom in how we are made even down to the holes in the very blood vessels that contain our precious blood supply this explanation is your first step into understanding both how the healing process starts and how disease can get its start. Blood enters these tiny capillaries. The capillaries may be so small in fact that the red blood cells have to go through single file just to fit in. Or the red blood cells will even fold in half to fit through these tiny spaces. And at that point they release the last of their oxygen. Now our circulatory system is a pressurized system. You've heard of high blood pressure, you've heard of low blood pressure, maybe you've even been told you have normal blood pressure, but all pressure nonetheless. Now the blood carries minerals, nutrients, oxygen, glucose, the simple sugar glucose, and the blood is between 87 and 92 percent water depending on who you ask. So these tiny pores exist so that the fluid in our bloodstream under pressure because we are a pressurized system can leak out on purpose so that the valuable minerals nutrients oxygen glucose can be delivered to your cells these various nutrients feed the cells or in other words the blood delivers the groceries through these tiny pores so that we can continue to thrive now it's at this point you may be thinking all right if there are holes in our blood capillaries and our bloodstream is under pressure and our blood is mostly water what keeps all this blood from leaving the circulatory system collapsing it and killing us well that can actually happen to people unfortunately it's called hypoalbuminemia 
It can occur when a person goes into extreme shock, among other unfortunate situations, and the blood protein known as albumin leaves the bloodstream in large enough amounts to bring fluids from the bloodstream with it, creating circulatory chaos. How does it do that? The picture you're looking at is a computer-generated image of the blood protein known as albumin. Its fellow blood proteins are globulin and fibrinogen, but this guy here, albumin, is what we're going to be focusing on for the rest of the discussion. Albumin is the smallest blood protein, and it has a negative charge, which means it's attracted to anything with a positive charge. And the water molecule has a positive charge on one side due to its two hydrogen atoms. What keeps fluid in our bloodstream? What keeps us from bleeding out inside of our own bodies? Albumin. This is how it works. The pores in the blood capillaries allow fluid containing nutrients, minerals, glucose, oxygen to get to the waiting cells. You are literally irrigating your own cellular farm. The albumin blood protein, having its negative charge, pulls the positively charged fluid right back into the bloodstream. And then, of course, the bloodstream, being under pressure, shoots the fluid right back out. And then the albumin, with its negative charge, magnetically draws the fluid back into the bloodstream. And this cycle is repeated uh, 80 times every minute. That's faster than once per second. It's very fast. Every second every day of your life. By using this micro-sized spraying mechanism, this is how the body takes a relatively small amount of blood and divides it up and divides it up and divides it up into finely administered micro-sized amounts all over your body. There is a constant delivery system in place all over you using this ingenious negative positive charge to control the amount of nutrients that get sent out through these tiny holes in the blood capillaries over over and over again feeding you nurturing you at this basic cell level in other words it's electricity folks we are electric beings our blood vessels have a negative charge on the inside and a positive charge on the outside and our red blood cells in a healthy state will also have a negative charge this is how the red blood cells can move in a friction-free superhighway environment. The negative charge on the inside of the blood vessel repels the negative charge of the healthy red blood cells so that the red blood cells are forced by magnetism to go zipping along inside the blood vessels with no clumping up and no traffic jams. Electricity. So, back to this picture here of the dry state. Now you're probably thinking, hey, you haven't explained how we get into this flooded condition here. Well, I'm working on it, slowly but surely, and if I've done my job right, the light bulb will go on over your head. So let's catch up here. Blood supply in the body is always under pressure. We have small pores in our capillary walls, these pores are for allowing nutrients to pass through and feed the cells. Blood protein, albumin, has a negative charge, but the fluid in our blood has a positive charge. Okay, now here's the twist to our story. No matter where this guy right here, the albumin molecule, is in the body, no matter where this blood protein ends up, it will still end up attracting water because that's one of its jobs is to hold the pressure inside the bloodstream not the only job by any stretch of the imagination but one of them is to attract and hold water that's what happened here on the right hand side of this slide albumin is in here among the cells of the body it has escaped the bloodstream and is now doing its job but in reverse instead of pulling water away from the cells and back into the bloodstream, it's actually pulling some water out of the bloodstream into the cellular areas and holding the water locked in place around your cells. We're going to find out the history of this discovery and its implications for you in part three.